Hello, everyone, and welcome to the GNEM Symposium Speaker Series, sponsored by the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation. My name is Noah Weisleder, and I'm excited to be here today to moderate this uh, very interesting session and uh, also to introduce our speaker for today. So we're very lucky today to have a, a, real, uh, a real luminary in several different fields to be able to present to us about some of her recent work in the field of GNE myopathy. Uh, Professor Sudha Bhattacharya conducted her undergraduate research and also her graduate work in India, where she earned both a Master's of Science and a PhD in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the Indian Agriculture Institute in New Delhi, uh, principally doing her research in the regulation of RNA synthesis. Then she went on to conduct uh, postdoctoral research at several uh, institutions in the United States as well, uh, including uh, Stanford University, the Boston Bio Biomedical Research Institute, and also the National Institutes of Health. After she completed her training, she joined Nehru University as an assistant professor uh, to set up a lab that was uh, involved in studying uh, a human parasite, Ento amoeba histologica, which uh, causes a, uh, a disease in humans. Then she rose through the academic ranks to become a full professor there of molecular biology, doing really important research in the gene expression and genome organization of this parasite and uh, really led to some seminal contributions to understanding of how its genome was organized, how it functioned, and really provided some very fundamental findings in the overall field of molecular biology. As a result, her work's been acknowledged in a number of different ways, including election as a fellow in the Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences in Allahabad. She has recently begun to show a lot of interest in GNE myopathy as well. Uh, she is the co-founder and trustee of the World Without GNE Myopathy, which is a nonprofit organization set up to promote bo both promote research towards an understanding and of and treating rare genetic diseases in throughout India, including GNE myopathy. In that role, she has contributed to several important recent studies in GNA myopathy. Uh, there's a, uh, several papers that have come out recently uh, that really show some important findings, both for the GNE population in India and also broadly across the entire world. So we're very excited to have her here today to give us a talk. And her t talk today is going to focus on potential therapeutic options for GNA myopathy, a topic I know is very uh, of great interest to everyone on this call and uh, some of the lessons that we can learn from other muscle diseases, how those can help guide our development of GNE myopathy therapeutics. So I will very happy to turn this over to Dr. Bhattacharya who will give us uh, her seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noah, for a very kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the NDF team for uh, inviting me to give this talk. It's a privilege for me. Uh, this series is of great value to all of us in the GNE myopathy field. Uh, so I'm very happy to contribute something to this series of talks. So uh, just to introduce you to uh, the matter that I'll be presenting today, I'll give a brief introduction about uh, GNE myopathy. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, that we are uh, the current efforts are going on to find treatments for this disease. Uh, spearheaded by NDF uh, to look at gene delivery using AAV vectors and NIH for supplementation uh, with the Cialic acid precursor MANDAC. So these are some of the most promising options that we have uh, today. Uh, but uh, we, uh, although the GNE community is small because you know this is a very rare disease, but uh, there are other therapies uh, which are being developed for more common uh, muscle diseases like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, and these, some of them are based on other uh, parameters like cell-based therapies or messenger RNA therapies. So uh, I'll be uh, looking uh, at those options that are uh, not yet fully developed, but they are there in the pipeline. Uh, the idea is that while we develop our own, uh, uh, own methods to uh, find treatments for GAD myopathy. It is nice to know what is happening in other fields and uh, 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 first have knowledge about it and then later on uh, figure out whether we can make use of any of those developments which are happening in other areas. Uh, so most of you are uh, familiar with GAD myopathy, but just a very brief introduction. 
so GNE myopathy is a rare genetic disease. That means we inherit it from our parents and we pass it on to a progeny and is caused by the mutations in the gene called GNE, uh, which is required by the body for sialic acid biosynthesis. Uh, so it is an adult onset disease. And uh, there's a lot of variation between uh, individuals, but generally we can say the general pattern is that it appears, the first symptoms appear between 20 to 40 years of age. And generally, again, it begins with uh, the distal muscles uh, of legs and arms. And then slowly there's a progressive weakening of muscles uh, throughout the body. And uh, it leaves the patients uh, severely disabled. Uh, so uh, to appreciate uh, the therapeutic options that we have, uh, it is nice to also know a little bit about this genetic disease. What do we mean by uh, the disease is genetic? That means we inherit it and the problem is in the DNA. So uh, just briefly to tell you that DNA is, uh, DNA molecule is, uh, you know, the molecule that we inherit from our parents and pass it on to our uh, progeny. And uh, this is the molecule which we can call, contains the code of life. Uh, so in the case of GNE myopathy or in any other genetic disease, uh, there could be a problem with the DNA. And in GNE, we know that the GNE gene is mutated somewhere or the other. Now, in the flow of information, from DNA to uh, finally the protein, uh, how it happens, we can just take a brief look. So it is a protein molecule in the cell. Uh, we have thousands of different kinds of protein molecules. They are the workhorse of the cell and they perform all the different functions that happen in our body. They're all performed by proteins. But how a protein is going to look like is determined by the DNA. So that code lies in the DNA. And this information uh, passes on from DNA to the RNA. So RNA is, uh, is a smaller molecule and it's a single strand. DNA is double stranded. And the RNA uh, molecule is a copy of the DNA. So it's the same language they're using, only it's a small copy. This is a very long DNA strand. And uh, in RNA, it's only a copy of the part that is required uh, at that moment in, by the cell. From RNA, the information flows to the protein. Now we have a change of language. Uh, so the language is now in amino acids, which form the protein. So we call it a translation. The RNA gets translated into the protein. And now when the protein is formed, it then does uh, its function. So in the case of GNE, we have a mutation in the GNE gene, which is passed on to the RNA, passed on to the protein. So the protein that we make, is not as uh, effective as it should be. And with the results that the muscle cells, uh, they begin to uh, get weakened and they slowly have a muscle loss. And uh, the effect is on sialic acid biosynthesis. That's the primary uh, role of the GNA gene. So at each step on the information flow pathway, uh, we could have potential uh, therapies. So like uh, at the DNA level, if we uh, give a normal copy of the GNA gene, which is gene therapy, then uh, we could uh, supplement the mutated gene which is already there and introduce another normal copy. So it will produce a normal uh, GNA protein. Or we could edit this uh, mistake which has happened. We can edit it right within the cell using CRISPR-Cas technology. We could uh, just leave the DNA alone and work at the level of RNA. So introduce a normal copy of the RNA, that is a messenger RNA or mRNA. It's called the mRNA therapy. Or we could uh, modify the protein, although the protein has lost some of its activity, but we could try to introduce some small molecules which can interact with the protein and make it functional. So that is also one possibility. Then because sialic acid Reduce so we could supplement with sialic acid or with the precursor of sialic acid that is MANNAC. And lastly, we could uh, introduce or trans uh, transplant healthy muscle cells uh, so that now we have 
the damaged muscle can be replaced by healthy muscle using cell based therapies so these are the options that we have and uh, gene therapy uh, and the two asterisks manlac and gene therapy are already you know that these options are being worked out uh, for gn myopathy and uh, we have to see how effective they are and uh, i'll be talking about the other two options that is mrna therapy and stem cell therapy which are in the pipeline for uh, dmd and uh, we will see whether you know how far have they reached and um, how useful can they be for gna myopathy so at this point i would also like to emphasize that you know uh, if we want to develop any of these options into a drug which can reach the patient it's a very laborious very intensive uh, process and uh, we cannot work on too many options at the same time it requires too much of effort in terms of money manpower and everything so we have to start with uh, you know like we have started with two options that's fine but uh, for the sake of knowledge we need to know what else is there what are the possibilities for us so my talk will basically tell us what are the other possibilities so i'll be talking about the cell based therapies and messenger rna mrna therapy uh, and uh, i have just checked the literature and i'll be talking to you about what is known in the literature for developments which are happening in tuition muscular dystrophy uh, dmd and in also some in limb girdle muscular dystrophy lgmd because dmd is much much more prevalent than gna myopathy so there's a uh, a lot of labs are all across the world are working on it so we have much, much more information and with lgmd we have a few active groups so that's how we have more information about these okay so uh, i'll talk about cell based therapies first so before we uh, go into i just want to tell you uh, what actually happens in the body when a muscle gets damaged <laughs> so the body has its own mechanism to uh, repair muscle and muscles are subject to damage uh, very frequently even when we exercise hard we can damage our muscles and gna myopathy also we know it causes damage to the muscles so this is a uh, actual muscle fiber and it has been photographed in this way and here what you see is a muscle stem cell of the body it's naturally occurring in the muscle fiber and is called a satellite cell or muscle stem cell and you can see a cartoon of it drawn here this is a muscle fiber and this is a satellite cell <clears throat> now whenever the muscle is damaged for any reason whatever reason then this satellite cell which was so far lying dormant it doesn't do anything it just lies there now when there is a muscle damage it gets activated that means uh, it now starts dividing <clears throat> so it can divide in two ways one is this planar division that is in a horizontal way a symmetric division and if it divides in this way then both the cells will eventually again become uh, satellite cells they will not convert into new muscle but if it divides in this uh, asymmetric fashion that means one cell on top of the other then the top cell will actually differentiate into a muscle cell and the bottom cell will uh, remain as a satellite cell <clears throat> so obviously we require uh, that this asymmetric division should take place so that we can regenerate new muscle <clears throat> this is just another diagrammatic representation so this is the uh, muscle stem cell the satellite cell which is lying uh, quiescent <clears throat> quietly and gets activated when muscle is damaged it starts dividing the cells fuse to form a myotube and then eventually a myofiber <clears throat> so then we ask the question that uh, uh, if we transplant healthy muscle stem cells then can we regenerate healthy muscle in place of damaged muscle in the body so this question has been uh, studied and in the mdx mouse model that is in the dmd dmd they have a very good mouse model called mdx so <clears throat> in that mouse model when they did this they transplanted the muscle stem cells 
they actually found very good engraftment of the new cells and improved muscle function. But when they repeated this with the DMD patients, then uh, the improvement was very negligible. So they didn't get the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, very good effect of transplantation in patients. So one problem here is because the, in the human muscle stem cells, uh, now when you are going to uh, engraft it into the uh, damaged muscle, you need a sufficiently large number of cells. So when you take out the cells from the patient or from any other source, the number is small and you have to uh, divide make those cells grow in the lab and increase the numbers and then only you transplant it into the patient. So in that process, you have to grow the cells in the lab and that's the process where the cells actually lose their ability to become new muscle. So what are some of the challenges that are being faced and what are the solutions that scientists are finding to um, meet these challenges? So the muscle stem cells, uh, which are uh, which take out from the body and grow in the lab, they lose their potential to regenerate. And what is the reason for it? So here I've shown that you know if you take out the stem cells, uh, when we grow them in the lab, we grow them in these plastic dishes. Now the plastic dish is a very rigid material, but the stem cell in the muscle is uh, has been uh, designed to grow on a very soft fiber. So here, for example, in this uh, small uh, you know, figure I'm showing, on top is a natural muscle fiber. And this is an elect electron micrograph picture which shows that this is a fiber and this is a stem cell which is very nicely sitting on top of the fiber. Now what scientists have done is to make an artificial fiber which is, looks like a muscle fiber. This is an artificial muscle fiber. And the stem cell actually can engage with this artificial muscle fiber the same way as it does in the natural scenario. So uh, what has been done is to make fibers out of biological material which resemble muscle fibers and grow the cells on these fibers. That's one method that has been used. The other method that has been used is to treat the cells with some uh, growth factors and some uh, molecules which will induce them to grow uh, better. So when these approaches have been used, uh, scientists have found that the engraftment is uh, much better. So uh, then the cells also have been found to not home very efficiently to the disease muscle. So, you know, when you inject these cells into the muscle, they should home into the disease muscle and uh, it should they should accept that as now their new environment and then grow there and mature there as new muscle. So uh, that efficiency is poor. So it has been uh, two different approaches are being tried. One is to pre-treat the cells. So the cells that you're injecting, uh, give them some pre-treatment with a variety of ways, uh, which we will not go through the details, but these are basically molecules that are uh, known to be, uh, to induce the cells to uh, differentiate and grow uh, you know, efficiently. And also but with the use of biomaterials, uh, which are injected along with the cells. So one approach is to pre-treat the cells. The second approach is to prime the muscle tissue, which is going to receive the cells. So the muscle tissue which receives the cells should be ready so that when the new cells arrive, it should be able to support the growth of those new cells. So here you can see that uh, you have the donor cells and you didn't give any treatment to them. When they're injected into the muscle tissue, they are very poorly engrafted. Uh, engraftment is not so good. But if you pre-treat them with the various factors, then now the engraftment is much improved. Similarly, if you uh, prime this muscle tissue, which is going to receive the cells, you prime it with various uh, mechanisms, then again, the engraftment is much better. So this is uh, uh, one development which has taken place. Uh, and uh, scientists are further improving this. Then another uh, thing is that the muscle stem cells, they have limited capacity to be grown and maintained in the lab. Uh, that's how they are. But we know about induced pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs, uh, which actually have 
much better capacity to be grown in the lab. So IPSC, as uh, I think many of you are familiar with it, that uh, if we can take any tissue of the body like skin or blood, we can actually, uh, using technologies which have been developed some time ago, we can induce them to become uh, stem cells. These are called the IPSCs, the induced pluripotent stem cells. And then these stem cells can be grown in the lab much more efficiently than the muscle stem cells. And then if we can differentiate them now to become muscle, because right now they're only stem cells, if we can differentiate them now to become muscle, then we can have a very good source of muscle stem cells. So this step of uh, differentiating them into muscle is still uh, inefficient, but the first step is highly efficient. So this approach is also being tried out. Then apart from uh, muscle stem cells and iPSCs, other cells like uh, mesangioplasts and mesial chymal stem cells, uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, I mean, exactly what they are, but like the mesangioplasts are stem cells which are found in the body in the blood vessels. So uh, these uh, cells have the ability to actually come out of the uh, blood vessel very easily and go into the muscle tissue. So the homing to the muscle tissue is very efficient with these cells. And mesial caramel stem cells are obtained from the bone marrow and from fat tissue. And they also have very good uh, ability to self-renew and convert into muscle. So these cells are also being tried. Basically, all the cell-based therapies can be of two types. One is that when you take the cells from the healthy donor, so that is not from you, your own body, but from a healthy donor. Uh, that is called allergenic. And the other is when the cells are taken from your own body. So that is autologous. Uh, now with allergenic, when you're taking it from another source, obviously th those are foreign cells to your body. So uh, the, your immune system is going to reject them. It's like an organ transplantation. And uh, you need to have immunosuppression if you uh, take uh, cells from another person's body. But the advantage is that uh, now their GNA gene is normal, so you don't need to correct the gene. You can just directly take those cells. So with this approach, it, there's a possibility to have off-the-shelf approach where just one kind of cell type has to be made and that can be used by all patients. In the autologous approach, the main thing is that you don't need any immune suppression because it's the cells from your own body, but you need to correct the gene because if you don't correct the gene, then again, the muscle that is formed will be uh, defective and it will not really be of much help. Uh, and this treatment, because it is taking cells from your own body, so it is personalized for each patient and uh, that could uh, increase the cost of the treatment. But both the methods, allogenic and autologous, are uh, being worked out. Okay, so I gave you some background about these. Now let us look at, uh, do we have any success stories at all using cell-based therapies? So I found that there are three pharmaceutical companies who are uh, really almost ready with products. Uh, although none of them has an absolutely ready product, but they are getting very close. So let's look at what are they doing. So satellose, bioscience, dystrogen, and beta. And uh, the one thing common with all of them is that they're all started by scientists who were working on the muscle cells in their own labs. And then they found some results which were very uh, you know, encouraging. And then they went ahead and opened the company. So these are all on very solid ground. These are scientists who are you know, spearheading these. So Satellos Bioscience, uh, <clears throat> now this is a, a company based in Canada and uh, their uh, strong point is that they are making a platform for muscle regeneration. And uh, so as I told you that muscle stem cell, they're calling it satelloid because they're working on those satellite cells, the muscle stem cells. And uh, these muscle stem cells, when we try to grow them outside the body, they're fussy, they don't grow very well. So they need a, a sort of a platform on which they can be grown, like an artificial muscle fiber and so on. So that's what Satellos is doing, is to make a platform where 
if you bring some uh, satellite cells from a muscle, they will be able to grow and regenerate very efficiently. So what they're doing is that using this platform, they are studying that what happens if there's a uh, mutation. Say they are working on DMD, so dystrophin gene is mutated. So what happens uh, if a cell is mutated in the dystrophin gene? On this platform, how will it behave? On this platform, if you put a healthy cell, it uh, grows nicely and becomes muscle. But what happens if I do the same thing with the DMD mutant? So what they found is that uh, in a DMD mutant, uh, when they use on the, their platform, actually uh, the satellite cell only goes through the symmetric division. So as I told you some slides ago that if the satellite cell is only dividing symmetrically, then it will not make new muscle. We need the asymmetric division so that one cell will then become muscle and the other cell will remain as a satellite cell. So uh, the cells which are mutated in DMD, they, don't, they are not good at this. Uh, they only do this symmetric division. They're not good at the asymmetric division. And that's why you don't have regeneration of new muscle. So what they did was they tried various drugs so that they can promote the DMD stem cell to uh, go through this asymmetric division. And they have a pipeline of these drugs which they're trying out. So the, they have got some encouraging results with the MDX mice and also with the uh, dog model of DMD. And they claim that they will probably reach clinical stage by uh, next year. So, uh, so, you know, uh, they have some drug candidates, but uh, the idea is to make a really uh, large library of these drug candidates so that if one doesn't work very efficiently, then they can, uh, you know, have a whole range of them to try out. And that's what they're doing. So they have a uh, very uh, large variety of these hundreds of novel compounds belonging to different chemical classes, which they're testing out on their system. And uh, the parent project muscular dystrophy uh, group has given them $1 million to optimize this uh, by looking at this uh, technology of crystal structure. You know, you can look at how a protein uh, folds in uh, three dimensions by crystal structure analysis. So they have been given money by PPMD to do this. And the uh, value of this technique is that it helps you to uh, in the lab itself to optimize which drug is going to work the best. And then once you optimize with this method, then you can go to the patient and test it out. Now, uh, very uh, nicely for us that Satellos is also uh, focusing on DMD, but is going beyond DMD also. So as I told you, it's a Canada-based company. And uh, the person who founded it, the scientist, his own uh, student has uh, started working on other muscle diseases. So they are collaborating with him. Uh, he's also in Canada and they are working on various other very rare muscle diseases like Lama 2 muscular dystrophy and collagen 6 related muscular dystrophy. So the platform of drugs which they already have, they're testing on these. And uh, so, I mean, I'm when I look at this, I'm hopeful that uh, even GNU myopathy could be studied uh, on this platform someday. Okay, so let's look at another company, Distrogen. Uh, Distrogen uh, uses a different method. Uh, they use a technology called the chimeric cell technology. Uh, in this technology, they are actually fusing two cells. So they take a healthy uh, human myoblast from a healthy donor, and they fuse it with the autologous uh, human myoblast from the DMD patient. So they are fusing these two cells, and they're getting a fused uh, chimeric cell, which they, uh, the aim is that this cell will be win-win situation, that it will make the dystrophin uh, contributed by the healthy donor, and it will make these uh, flags which are outside, these are the molecules, which the immune system will recognize as self, uh, which is from your own uh, DMD patient. So this cell will be recognized as self by the uh, immune system, and it will be making uh, healthy dystrophin. Uh, with that aim, they are making these chimeric cells and then injecting them into the patient and uh, then seeing what, what will happen. Uh, the advantages of this technology is that uh, the need for immunosuppression is reduced because you are expressing self-antigen on the chimeric cell. 
you don't need to manipulate the cell. Ge genetic correction is not needed because you are uh, expressing the uh, the normal dystrophin from the healthy donor. And so you don't need to use viral vector for gene delivery, et cetera, which has its own problem in, in case of in the in terms of immune response. So this technology in principle can be, if it works for DMD, which they're trying, it could be applied to uh, other muscle diseases because all you need is a healthy myoblast from uh, from a healthy donor and then one myoblast from the patient. Uh, so they have uh, studied with MDX mouse model and uh, they have been able to get encouraging results. Uh, and based on this, they have the phase one clinical trial was done with three DMD boys to check the safety of this approach uh, over a period of three months. And all the three participants showed improvement in muscle uh, functions and uh, the toxicity was not there. So they have now been given permission to increase the dose. So earlier they were using 2 million cells per kg body weight. Now they are doubling it. And uh, so this is this trial uh, will continue and uh, we will look forward to seeing what do they get out of it. Uh, so the third company that uh, I'll talk is the Vita Therapeutics, which is based uh, in USA. And uh, this company is working on uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs. And uh, so with iPSC, the, uh, the problem is that it, uh, to regenerate it into muscle, that's where uh, you know, the inefficient step is there. Uh, so they are uh, trying both the autologous and the allogenic approaches. That is a personalized autologous approach where you take cells from the patient themselves and the allogenic approach where you make iPSC uh, from healthy donor and then convert them into muscle. Uh, so this, as I said, is the off the shelf approach. And what they're doing is because uh, the problem is if you take uh, healthy donor cells and put them into the patient, they are recognized as non-self and then there's a huge immune reaction. So they are actually genetically engineering these cells to reduce their uh, immunogenicity. So making them hypoimmunogenic so that they will not be uh, recognized so strongly by the immune system. So beta therapeutics uh, is very positive that they are going to meet the two grand challenges of cell therapy. That is to get enough cells in the lab and then differentiate them into the right cell type. And uh, the scientists who are behind this are really experts in this. So uh, hopefully they are, they'll be able to develop this technology. They are already out with certain products like VTA 100 is an autologous treatment uh, which they have de uh, developed for LGMD2A, that is calpinopathy. And VTA 200 is, a, uh, uh, is an allogenic product which uh, will be a universal kind of cell and they are making it hypoimmunogenic. So these two products they already have and they are trying them out. Uh, so B VTA 100 is in quite an advanced stage. Uh, it's an autologous treatment uh, for uh, LGMD. And uh, I'm quoting from their site, what they say is that uh, this therapy, if it works out, then it will not only replace and repair the damaged muscle, but it will also support long lasting repair of future muscle damage. So that's really encouraging. And they are recruiting 15 LGMD patients for the first clinical trial. Okay, so that's what I had to say about the cell-based therapies. So uh, as you have seen that there are a lot of uh, advancements which have taken place, but it's still, uh, we still have some way to go before we know uh, how well these are going to work. Uh, but the scientists are at it and uh, they are improving whatever challenges they face, they keep on working on them. Then another approach I want to talk about briefly is the messenger RNA-based therapy, that is mRNA. So just to once again tell you that uh, M, the DNA code is what uh, you know gets uh, translated to the protein, and the proteins are the ones which do all the work. And the intermediate step is of mRNA. So DNA cannot directly transfer the code to the protein, it has to go through the intermediate of uh, mRNA. 
So the information from DNA is copied into mRNA and then the mRNA is translated into the language of protein. So uh, in DNA, uh, gene therapy, we uh, introduce the DNA copy, which is normal. But in mRNA therapy, we don't touch the DNA. We only give a normal copy of the mRNA because that normal copy will now produce the normal GNA protein. So mRNA therapies uh, have become a household name after this mRNA vaccines were made for COVID. And they were hugely successful, the, both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, which are based on messenger RNA. Uh, but briefly, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, the success which uh, was, it happened overnight, was actually behind that there was a lot of effort going on uh, by these companies. And they were actually working on genetic diseases and cancer. So uh, the mRNA therapies, okay, so why people are interested in it at all? So when we compare with DNA-based therapies, uh, there are some advantages of mRNA therapies. So one is that they are not genotoxic. That means uh, whenever we handle DNA, that means if I introduce a normal copy of the DNA to a cell, uh, there's a slight chance that I might uh, play around with the genetic makeup of that uh, cell and it could be toxic. So that genotoxicity is not a problem because uh, I'm not handling DNA, I'm handling only RNA. And RNA has one inherent property, which is actually quite, uh, it's a double-edged sword. It, it is good also and bad also. Uh, so the property is that RNA is an unstable molecule. It doesn't last long. It is made and then it does its job of uh, coding for the protein and then it's degraded. Whereas DNA is very stable, it remains forever. So uh, it's a good thing because, you know, if uh, so the toxicity uh, effect will not be forever. If uh, you gave a high dose of RNA and it was toxic, it will vanish on its own. And then next time you can take a lower dose. But uh, the bad thing is that since it is unstable, so you cannot just give one dose. Uh, you have to periodically keep on giving, uh, you know, keep taking RNA. So dosing can be controlled but then uh, it has to be given repeatedly. And delivery of RNA to the cells can also be simpler using only some lipid nanoparticles. So uh, what were the problems that uh, were being faced by scientists who were working on RNA and trying to develop it as a technology? So one is that it is rapidly degraded, as I told you, that's how it is designed by nature to be rapidly degraded. But if I'm using it as a therapy, then uh, I need that a molecule should last for some time. If it uh, gets broken down very fast, it will be of no use. Uh, then the uptake was very poor by the cells. Uh, and then it was immunogenic also. So it in elicited strong immunogenic response uh, when it was injected into the body. So these were the three negative things for which uh, the initial attempts at RNA in the 1990s, a uh, lot of work was going on and then it stalled. So here I would like to uh, say that, you know, the way science progresses is not only by the people who get Nobel Prizes, but, you know, it's a very slow process. And there are a lot of unsung heroes of science. And this lady, uh, Kathleen Kerico, is one of those unsung heroes. So in the 1990s, when people were uh, failing with RNA therapy, then uh, Kathleen didn't give up and she continued actually to work on and to see how she can solve the problems. And uh, very, very daringly, she worked for a whole decade and finally she actually solved it. And she showed that if you can make some chemical modifications in the RNA, then uh, the RNA that you make is less immunogenic. It is much more stable in the cell and it is, it is get, getting translated into the protein also with much more efficiently. So that was a major breakthrough. And after that, uh, this mRNA field uh, started growing. Uh, after 2005, it started growing very well. So uh, mRNA therapy basically needs the RNA itself. And it needs uh, a vehicle which will carry the RNA into the cell, which is a nanopart lipid nanoparticle, like a fat droplet. Uh, so this is what the lipid nanoparticle looks like. It's like a casing in which the RNA is kept. And this casing has a lot of roles to play. And that's why, uh, you know, most of the companies who are using this therapy, they have their own 
uh, they've developed their own uh, this vehicle, the LNP vehicle, and those are patented. So uh, the most advanced uh, LNP particles are the ones which go to liver. Liver is an easy uh, organ to target, but for muscle targeting, uh, there aren't that many options that we have, but uh, they are working on it. Uh, then the thing is that, uh, you know, once the once this, uh, the vehicle goes into the cell, it should deliver its cargo right into the cytoplasm inside the cell. So uh, those are they're being designed in a way that uh, they the RNA should not get stuck in it. You know, it should come out of it and deliver it into the cell. And then the coating which is left behind once the RNA is delivered into the cell, it should get degraded. It should be biodegradable. Otherwise, it will accumulate in the body and that can be toxic. So these are some of the things which uh, companies are working on it. Uh, so the challenges that we have uh, is that, you know, uh, the RNA has to get uh, translated into protein. It's the protein which will do the job. So uh, if the efficiency of translation into protein is low, then it is still good enough for mRNA vaccines because you need only nanogram to microgram amounts of protein for a vaccine. But if I want to cure a genetic disease, then I need, uh, you know, maybe thousand times more milligram or gram amounts of protein. So I really have to make the translation system very efficient. Uh, then the uh, delivery to non-liver is also another uh, challenge. And uh, the LNP toxicity, uh, how to make it, you know, less toxic, that is another challenge. Uh, so various companies, uh, actually including Moderna, are... Uh, coming out with products for genetic diseases. And uh, as I said, that they were already working on it before COVID struck. And uh, so the moment COVID struck, they were ready with the products. And since for vaccine, you don't need a whole lot of protein. So uh, they could bring it out very rapidly. Now, in terms of uh, muscle disease, uh, one company, Art Bioscience, is working on DMD for mRNA therapy. And uh, they uh, have everything in place. Uh, so they have proprietary LNPs uh, and they, uh, which are going to muscle cells more efficiently. And uh, they have made the RNA, which is, uh, doesn't, uh, has reduced immunogenicity, is translated efficiently, and it is stable. So they have everything in place. And now they are uh, going to try it out for DMD. Uh, another very promising uh, uh, new development which has taken place in RNA field is uh, the development of circular RNA. And I just want to briefly tell you that because as I told you, the RNA molecule is very unstable. So, and it is also immunogenic. So for both of those properties, actually it is the two ends of the molecule which are responsible. So it is the two ends where the degradation starts from the ends. And the immunogenicity is also because of the ends when the it, RNA goes into the body, the, the free ends are recognized by the immune system. Now, if you make it circular, then the ends disappear. It's now there are no ends. And now uh, this circular one is much more stable and much less immunogenic. So it's going to be uh, really a great, uh, you know, if it works. So there are companies which are doing this. There's a company called Laron, which is making this endless RNA, they call it. Very nice name they've given, circular RNA. And what I liked about what they're doing is that they are actually developing it in a way that it's like a modular approach. So they're making this endless RNA, which will work for any disease. Uh, so all the other components of the RNA are uh, uniform. They'll be same for any disease. But let's say now they have put here a cassette uh, which carries a dystrophin gene. So in that case, this will work for DMD. But if they remove this cassette and now replace it with GNA gene, then the same thing can work for GNA. So it's like a modular and programmable approach in which uh, quite rapidly you can uh, reprogram it for any other disease. Uh, another company is the Orna, uh, which is working again on this circular RNA. So they have a very nice platform here. They've made uh, from the linear RNA, they have put the right sequences at the two ends so that very efficiently it becomes uh, into a circle. 
and uh, Orna is uh, <clears throat> also uh, working on various diseases like cancer and uh, then DMD. So uh, in DMD, uh, they have worked with a mouse model and uh, with their circular RNA, they have obtained very good expression of the microdystrophin. Uh, and of course, because uh, the, this technology is redosable, uh, so you can keep uh, giving it uh, again and again, and you can uh, see which dose works best. And uh, it is delivered by the so they have they have uh, worked out the delivery vehicle which goes which is safe and it goes to muscle, and uh, it is also uh, redosable. So in their own word, they say that they are only a few short steps away from potentially spectacular success. So that's, uh, I mean, they do sometimes say more than what they should, but it sounds very encouraging. Okay, so that uh, brings me to the end of my talk. And uh, to give you the key takeaways that there are many innovations that are in the pipeline for muscle diseases, apart from what we already know, that is gene therapy and gene editing. Uh, many other are also happening. Now, each technology has its own plus and minus points. Uh, so as I told you already, the various minus points for each and the pluses. The cell-based therapies are giving very promising results for DMD and LGMD, but so far it is still early days and the clinical data is uh, still small. mRNA-based therapies are progressing rapidly uh, and once they're developed for DMD, then hopefully, it will be uh, not so, so difficult to adapt them to GNE myopathy as well. And uh, finally, for the patients, uh, I would like to uh, give a special note to patients. All the therapies that I've talked about and all the other therapies that they're familiar with, uh, it's a slow process of developing the therapies so that it comes to patients because it should not have negative effects. Uh, whenever it comes to patients, it should be safe and effective. So the wait for a therapy is long. So meanwhile, uh, uh, as you know, you can help yourself by taking adequate nutrition, exercise, and rest, and stay positive. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for that very informative talk, a very interesting discussion of several of the really cutting edge therapeutics that are being developed for a variety of neuromuscular diseases. And of course, they all have their unique challenges and you highlighted some of those particularly well. So uh, I will open this up to questions uh, from the audience. If the audience has any questions, please feel free to put them into the question and answer box uh, and I will uh, bring those up to Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, in the meantime, while those are coming together, I actually had a couple of quick questions for you. I'm uh, very familiar with the uh, uh, the Satellos technology that's being developed, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that uh, to the fore there. So uh, uh, that sort of focuses on the technology of sort of balancing uh, different types of or different populations of, of satellite cells there. Uh, do you think that uh, one of the things that I have not a concern with, but, uh, but I think is relevant in that is you may see different changes in satellite cell populations based on different diseases. So I kind of wonder what your thoughts are in terms of leveraging. Uh, they're obviously focused, as you mentioned, on uh, limb girdle disease, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and DMD. Do you think that those? Uh, how well do you think the lessons that are there might that can be learned from that might be adapted to applying them in a in a different disease like GNE myopathy? Yeah, yeah, that's a very relevant question that you've asked, and uh, you know uh, what they found is that. Uh, the DMD, uh, you know, when they take a satellite cell from a DMD patient, then uh, it's not efficient in differentiating. Now, we have to see whether the same happens with GNE. Right. So, uh, you know, because even in GNE, to some extent, regeneration of the muscle is poor. So, if I take a satellite cell from a GNE uh, with a GNE mutation, uh, how, how efficient is it uh, to differentiate? And if I find that it is not as efficient, which is quite likely to find that its efficiency may be lower than uh, a normal cell. Then they have a whole pipeline of new drugs which they're coming out with, you know, a chemical pipeline. And uh, that pipeline they're developing so that they can then test it out with uh, any other disease. And uh, if it works, then they have a small molecule drug. Uh, small molecule drug has its uh, great advantages 
you don't need to manipulate the system and uh, if the satellite cell within the body itself is induced to differentiate then it's a way, much easier way to you know, achieve uh, that so yeah so we are, we don't know whether how how much defective is uh, the satellite cell in a gne patient that we don't know yeah no i i agree yeah that's that's probably a point that we would need to find to really fully understand that because there have has been work done uh, for example the the stem cell bank oh not the stem cell bank but the the patient cell line bank that's been established by the ndf uh, we've worked with some of those cells and some other researchers have worked with those cell lines as well and and they certainly there it does appear to be some variation in terms of how well they at least at the cellular level can differentiate in myotubes well it's a different experimental system it certainly points to the idea there might be altered uh, fusion or proliferation of those cells that could re, could also see that in uh, satellite cells from GNE patients. But to my knowledge, I agree there hasn't been a lot of assessment of satellite cells in GNE patients to this point. So yeah, definitely some yeah, work so that would need to be done. I think my whole thing is that we should uh, we should have labs working on these. You know, for GNE myopathy, if we have labs who are looking at this then we get more information and that helps us to save time and we don't have to go in directions which are not going to matter for us certainly yeah no it, it, it's always good to have a strong foundation before you try to build the house of course you know so um yeah. <laughs> th there's a question here from the audience uh the first question is is there any relation of gene expression uh, like the gne muscular dystrophy gene with food insensitivity, like a gluten, or I guess a gluten allergy. Okay, yeah, I mean, gene expression, you know, it can be uh, affected by all kinds of factors. Uh, so they may not be a direct correlation because gluten may not directly affect, but uh, many indirect, uh, you know, indirectly any perturbation in your body will have an effect on uh, the whole system. Uh, so there's no direct, uh, you know, effect on gene expression as such. At least I don't know of any such direct effect. But indirectly, uh, if you have a gluten, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sensitivity, then yeah, it could it could be problematic. Thank you. I, I see a hand raised. Actually, uh, perhaps they wanted to ask their question. Uh, uh, Mohammed Khan, did you have a question you wanted to ask? You could unmute or you can put it in the uh, question and answer box. Be happy to uh, relay it in that fashion as well. Um, hello? Hello. Hi, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah hello. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I just yeah, wanted hello. to. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, hope is a nutrition exercise interest. You mentioned at the last concluding point. Am I audible? Uh, we can hear you. I, I I'm not sure if I got the question. Yeah, the question is uh, regarding nutrition. Uh, nutrition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So nutrition. Uh, see, I I cannot say that I'm right, I'm the right person to you know give you advice on that. But uh, doctors, you know, since we don't have a treatment, they really emphasize on good nutrition. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to take uh, too high protein, but you take a balanced diet. But make sure that you know you have adequate protein input, and uh, uh, you know, especially from Indian subcontinent, we tend to have. Uh, rich food so try to avoid you know those foods which are rich in fats uh, so basically a balanced diet which is enriched with protein uh, that is what uh, they recommend excellent thank you for that there's another question in the chat uh, how is epigenetics helpful towards solving the issue of our of gne myopathy is there any progress i guess in the area of G uh, epigenetics and gne Just a minute. Uh, epigenetics. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So you know, as I was saying, that uh, we don't have enough labs uh, 
all over the world working on GNE myopathy. So there are a lot of questions. Uh, if basic science can provide the answers, it accelerates our process of uh, you know finding therapies. But right now, uh, epigenetic uh, influences on GNE myopathy, all those things are not. Uh, they need to be studied. And uh, you know every study requires funding, and it's a it's a long process. So I've tried to emphasize on uh, those aspects where things are more ready. You know they're in in a state of readiness already. So companies are already working on it, uh, and therefore we can maybe make benefit of it. But yeah, epigenetics uh, people have worked on you know inhibitors which uh, uh, inhibit the epigenetic process and. Uh, they could have a benefit, but I did not find any such thing very encouraging for DMD or for LGMD. So I did not pick up on those topics. I, yeah, I'd agree with that, uh, that there's uh, uh, certainly some progress in that area, but I don't think that uh, epigenetic targeting therapy is imminent, uh, certainly in neuromuscular disease. Another question, a lot of questions coming in. That's great. Uh, would you have any guidance for those still awaiting a diagnosis of exactly what type of muscular dystrophy they suffer from? And then uh, follow on to that. It looks like, are there any institutions in the world that are specifically dedicated to muscular dystrophy analysis? Yeah, so, you know, luckily, uh, now we have a lot of companies who are, uh, you can go for the whole, uh, whole genome or clinical exome sequencing and those facilities are available. Uh, even in India, we have quite a few now companies who are offering those services. They are uh, somewhat expensive, but uh, they are within reach. And uh, even the government agencies are actually providing money also for these. So it's not that difficult now anymore to get a very accurate diagnosis of uh, GNE myopathy. Uh, by using a clinical exome, I think the clinical exome procedure is the most uh, suitable for us. Yes, and it, it depends. Yeah, certainly it will depend a bit on what country you're in for what sort of a diagnosis or what resources that are available to make that sort of a diagnosis. Um, if you'd like to reach out to uh, me, as a, I can certainly provide you with additional, uh, the, the attendee, um, I'll put my email in the chat. I'm happy to provide more uh, uh, country-specific uh ways okay. to be able to make a diagnosis as well just uh but but most uh most countries do have some means as as dr bachachari was saying some means to be able to make a genetic diagnosis and that's become much more easy to accomplish in recent years with the advances in genomics technology so definitely there's great opportunities there now and there was a follow-up to that as well if we'd like to join a clinical trial how would we go about doing that yeah, so you know, that is very trial specific. There can't be a general thing about it. So as you know that uh, NIH has opened the clinical trial for uh, for MANNAC, but you have to be eligible for it. They have some conditions. So it's like you have to you know uh, try try it out for each trial, whichever uh, is announced. Uh, there's no general guideline for it. So clinicaltrials.gov site, if you check, then you can get information about clinical trials which are you know planned or ongoing. Certainly. And if you're in the United States, there's clinicaltrials.gov, which will list all clinical trials in the United States, and that probably catches the major and that will catch the majority of type of trials around the world. Many of those um, will be in the United States and other countries as well. So that would be a good place to start to find information on specific clinical trials. But as Dr. Bhattacharya said, you, you do need to uh, apply to each of those trials individually, and they'll have some information there as well, how to go about do that on individual trials. Uh, let's see. Uh, the, another question. Thank you for a very informative talk. And, uh, thank, and thanks for the encouragement of the many treatments in the pipeline for DMD. Uh, can you talk about the challenges in taking a potential treatment for DMD and modifying it to make it work for GNEM? Yeah, so that's the big challenge. <laughs> uh, the, the purpose of my, you know, telling all this is that uh, we should be aware of what is there. And uh, once something is ready for it, then, uh, you know, the challenge is that we have to then attract a company uh, who will uh, find it worthwhile to uh, modify that, you know, the uh, 
I'm hoping that whatever treatment comes out will not be that difficult to modify for GNA myopathy. So, uh, you know, uh, if it's a matter of uh, trying out the same drug which was tried for DMD, whether it works for us, or the same technology like the chimeric cell technology, in which we only need to replace, uh, you know, the healthy donor uh, will be the same and uh, the donor instead of DMD will be a GNE patient. So uh, those technologies, if they work out for us, then the challenge is to interest the company, like the company who's doing it for DMD, uh, will it be worthwhile for them to do it for GNE myopathy? And uh, that's where uh, it's important that we have a, a whole registry of patients so that we can tell them that these are all the patients in so many countries who are ready to take this uh, treatment whenever it's ready. And uh, when the pharma companies see that there are already uh, groups of cohorts of patients who have been well characterized, then they're encouraged to take it up. Uh, so while we wait for a therapy, I think at least we should have the registries and the natural history studies in place uh, so that we can hopefully attract pharma companies who are already working for DMD to come to GNE myopathy. Uh, but Excellent. yeah, it's a it's a very very complex issue. I mean, the challenges will be too many. Indeed. Uh, so I think that wraps up the questions that we have. We did have multiple comments also in the question and answer, uh, thanking you for your presentation and making it understandable uh, for the patients who are present there. Um, I, I'd also like to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Also, it was very informative, also for scientists as well. So too, thank you for. Uh, an excellent presentation. We appreciate that. Before I uh, before I end today's session, I'd like to make two announcements. The the first being one that relates to another of the uh, scientific advisors here at the NDF. I wanted to let the community know that uh, for those of you who don't know already, uh, that Rich Horgan, one of our scientific advisors, who also heads up the Cure Rare Disease Foundation. Uh, they have recently received approval for uh, for the first in class DMD therapeutic uh, using CRISPR technology, and to uh, do a first in man trial uh, on one patient to be able to see if this new drug that uh, uses CRISPR technology to modify the DMD gene can have therapeutic efficacy in a human patient. So this is really a major accomplishment not just in this field, but in many fields. It's really one of the first therapeutics uh, to go into patients using CRISPR technology I'm sure many of you have already heard about. So this is quite an accomplishment for CRD and for Rich, uh, so I wanted to highlight that. I've actually spoke with him earlier uh, on this week, um, I guess last week now, and that uh, to talk about that, and actually it looks like they're going to do the actual infusion of the therapeutic very early on next month. So uh, it's very exciting news and uh, quite the accomplishment. And we're glad to have Rich here working with us on trying to do the same thing for GNEM myopathy. Uh, along those lines, I'd also like to mention that we will, can, uh, we'll, uh, speaking of gene therapy for GNEM, we're continuing our series, uh, our speaker series next month. Uh, that is going to take place uh, on uh, September 25th, the same time, 9 p.m. Pacific time, or 9 a.m. rather, Pacific time, sorry. And the speaker for that would be Dr. Julie Crudell, who's at the University of Washington. She's doing uh, developing new viral vectors for the treatment of GNE myopathy, so it should be a very interesting talk for those of you interested in treatments for GNEM as well. So we're happy to have her coming to uh, do our next talk, but let's all thank Dr. Bhattacharya for an, another great talk today. And uh, we appreciate everything that you put into putting this talk together and we hope to talk to you again soon.